This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, I wanted, I wanted to th thank you all for, for coming. Um, uh, this is our third lecture in the NERSC keynote lecture uh, seminar series, and, and uh, we've actually gotten great attendance on all of them, and so we appreciate, uh, I recognize a number of people I know that a uh, number of you come to each of these, and uh, this has been a fantastic opportunity to learn s more about the ways in which computation is making an impact on, on uh, leading edge science. Uh, there are also about a, uh, probably somewhere around 100 or 200 people who are watching online. Uh, and then we're also making the lectures available uh, so that people can watch them later. And so, so uh, I'll ask Professor Smoot to tell me if the, the, the lights are too bright, but it's for the recording. You see your shadow on the screen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Smoot is an astrophysicist, cosmologist, and Nobel laureate who has been recognized worldwide for his groundbreaking research in cosmic microwave background radiation and the origins of the universe. Professor Smoot was one of the first astrophysicists to devise ways to conduct experiments that produce data and information about the early universe. Using tools such as the Cosmic Background Explorer, a satellite launched in 1989, he and his colleagues made the first measurements of temperature fluctuations in microwave background radiation and set the stage for later measurements. These findings also enabled them to discover the seeds of present-day galaxies and galaxy clusters and map the early universe in unprecedented ways. In 2006, Professor Smoot and fellow astrophysicist uh, John C. Uh, Mather were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work with the Cosmic Background Explorer, which validated the Big Bang Theory. Uh, Professor Smoot has been the recipient of the Einstein Medal, the Gruber Prize, uh, the Oersted Medal, and the uh, Ernest O. Lawrence Award. Uh, he's been involved in observational astrophysicists and physics and cosmology research at Berkeley Lab since the early 1970s and is a professor of physics at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's also made uh, guest appearances on, on TV shows like The Big Bang Theory, which I did watch, and I guess are you smarter than a fifth grader, which I haven't had a chance to watch yet. So <laughs> let me uh, introduce Professor Spoot. Thank you. I was invited here by several people, some of whom you see in the room, but one of them was Horst Simon, who liked to remind me how old I was, and he said, you had some great pictures of old computers, and so forth. <laughs> Can you please show those, and so forth. And so uh, he's forced me to face the fact that I'm a little old. And then 50 years ago, two things happened that have had a profound impact on my career. So one of them is the obvious, namely the cosmic microwave background was discovered 50 years ago. It's actually discovered 50 years ago, but published one year later. And uh, the, the second one was that I learned how to use computers for scientific research. And uh, so those were, those were two really major events that profoundly influenced my, my career. I'll talk about them indirectly along this way. But like always, and anywhere you're doing research or anywhere you're making uh, technical progress, there are always precursors. So I'll remind you, there was an ENIAC computer, <laughs> which was the first, the first electronic general purpose computer. And that was in 1946. And it had 17,000 vacuum tubes, which means it was working about half time, right? because the vacuum tubes don't last very long. But that's the, so if you, if you really link back, the guys that had the foresight to build this computer, which cost about the same as the supercomputer system today, in terms of what's going on, they're the ones that started this path. And they even started a course, once it was released and made known, they even started a course to train people how to build computers and how to design and build computers. And so that, there's a lot of seeds that come from that. The other thing that happened near the same time, and both of these are sort of outgrowths of activities that happened during World War II, as are several other things, and was the prediction of the cosmic uh, background radiation. So in 1948, George Gamow, who was a refugee from the Soviet Union uh, in the earlier days that had come to the United States and worked uh, in the war effort and worked in nuclear physics with Edward Teller. In fact, he and Teller did a lot of work together. He got Teller 
out of the, out of the Soviet bloc. Uh, they worked on nuclear physics and so forth. And he was trying to come up with a calculation to figure out what the, how the elements were created in the Big Bang. And he and his grad student and postdoc actually figured out how to do it. And Alpha and Herman, who were the graduate student and the postdoc respectively, they uh, were able to estimate the temperature of this cosmic background should be around five Kelvin. They published it. It was mostly forgotten for a while. But in 1965, Pinsley and Wilson published their results. So here's the pictures. And they got the Nobel Prize in 78 and so forth. And I'll come back to that in a second. So immediately this was confirmed because there turned out to be gas clouds that have molecules in them. And the, the cosmic microwave background were exciting some of those. So very quickly, people had old measurements they could reinterpret. So within a year, the cosmic microwave background, I, I forget I had this fancy tool. Uh, you know, the cosmic microwave, microwave background had had observations from the you know CH molecule, CN cyanogen molecule, and from the Berkeley group, from the Princeton group. Benson and Wilson made two measurements. They originally made the measurement here because that's what Bell Labs was paying to do was to see if they could send radio signals to the sky and back, and they needed to know the background. They wanted to measure at 21 centimeters, and so they had built a receiver for that in order to measure the hydrogen, and so. Already within the first year, you were starting to trace out this curve. And this is the prediction of a three Kelvin black body. Right? So that was pretty good. Didn't take too long, 65 to the announcement in 65 to uh, 1978. They got the Nobel Prize. And here's a picture of them at that time standing in front of their antenna and the little operating room in which they took their data. And so I'll remind the people here that they, they made a mistake. You know, 11 years later, after the Nobel Prize, they declared this a national historic site. So historic site is, takes longer than a Nobel Prize. So just bear that in mind. But if you hadn't destroyed my lab and the equipment on the roof, it would be a national historic site in two more years, in 2017. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes, right? Uh, so back to this. It's a big antenna. So Bell Labs had built this antenna uh, in order to look at the Telstar satellite. And then it hired Pinces and Wilson. Uh, Wilson was actually straight out of graduate school. The first paper he ever wrote was to discover the cosmic microwave background. Good start. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so this is their equipment. And I went to visit their equipment, which is in the Deutsches Museum in Munich. And I took this picture. And this picture, particular picture, I pulled out because this is the computing power. Okay. You guys may not recognize this as computing power. This is a thing we call a strip chart recorder. Okay, this is before, this is in the old days of analog computers and doing things by hand. I'll give you an idea of what that looked like. Okay, so remember here's the antenna. You see it can rotate. Here's the scan where if you're at 90 degrees, you're looking through the least atmosphere. And as you swing down towards the horizon, you see this, what should be a, a, a cosecant curve. You see the temperature. From that, you can estimate the temperature of the atmosphere. And then you do the trick. This is the best slide I happen to have at the time of the, well, here's the equipment in the museum, but of the actual discovery chart. But I found this. Now, this is how we used to take data in the old days, the really old days. This is the strip chart. There's a calibration here on Cassiopeia A, a nice known radio source. And then the calibration where they switch between the sky and the coal load, and then do the Xena scans you saw later on. So this is the discovery. And you see, what we used to do is use these chart recorders and just count the number of little squares and estimate what the level was, and write it down, and do additions and subtractions. Right? That's how we did it. Right? OK, so that was the first impact. You can see the CMB was taxing the computer power they thought they had. But, you, but the technical power, the equipment that's in here, you know, this door you wouldn't be surprised to see in a lab today. This stuff still works. This stuff we think is really old-fashioned. Okay. Uh, but another thing that happened to me, and this is the thing that I was really proud of, this is 50 years ago. This is the IBM 360. Now, I was working at MIT, and the Laboratory for Nuclear Science bought one of these, one of the early ones of these. And I was very proud because I took the course, and I got my own key so I could analyze data using this IBM 360. And I uh, you know, could come in at night you know, when nobody else was here, was there, and use my key and run the computer and put the data in and do it. Now, just in case you guys want to know what computer nerds look like in those days. <laughs> this is, well, if you're at IBM, you have to wear a kind of a suit. But they don't wear the blue. You know, they don't wear the, you know, the, the kind of stuff. But you'll notice their registers. They're flashing lights. 
That's why they're still in science fiction film flashing lights on the computers, because this was the one that really started it all. And here's a picture. She's not a nerd. She was a model that was hired by IBM to <laughs> advertise it. Ours is blue. Most of the panels are blue, but some of them were red. But, so the thing that I remember about this is not only was it great as a young kid, I got to run this supercomputer, right, because that was the supercomputer in those days. But uh, the other thing I remember very much is the punch cards. So you guys may not, some of you may be too young to actually have seen an IBM punch card. But for this computer, we actually had, someone had brought and kept in the system a couple of file drawers of punch cards. And when you read them in through the, the, car, the giant card reader, it would play anchors away. The, it would start and stop the, 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 the card reader. That made a lot of sound because it was very noisy. But on the big printers, it was printing out a picture of a ship. And it would do that in time to make the music. And it would spin the, the, and the lights would flash. It was, very, it was like an orchestra. It was, <laughs> it was quite spectacular. That I remember really well. Unfortunately, I don't have a recording of that. But I do have a recording of the, of the, of the, uh, the IBM 1430 playing raindrops. Right. And this was before computer generated music. This is computer played music, right? So it's very different. And and there were people who eventually learned how to do things when we got to faster computers, how to actually put your radio on the computer and play through the play play the sounds of the circuits changing through the radio. So that's the good old days, right? So the you know, the the computer center, you know, there are lots of little little chads and <laughs> Things like that that we, we, we had in those days. But here was the breakthrough that made a lot of the science possible for us. Digital Equipment Corporation was, while I was at the same area, building in their, in their garage or their parents' garage the, what turned out to be uh, the PDP-11. So what was great about that? Instead of being in this big temperature controlled room with humidity and everything, it was in a garage and I had to work in a garage. That meant we can build stuff that could go out in the field and take data, right? That's the, and the other thing that it had was it had a real-time operating system with a foreground task. So you could run two jobs at once. You can take data, and you can look at it and see if it's looking OK in terms of what's going on. And you may not recognize these. These are paper tape readers. You guys are lucky if you never have to deal with paper tape readers. But we had a big step forward with this right before when you were looking at these guys. These, these things, you could tell what was going on in the computer because these were the registers and the lights told you. What, you. You just had to read the lights and then convert it to octal and figure out what was going on. We had a big step forward with these computers because we started having terminals. And we adapt, the pe what people did was they adapt teletype terminals. So this is the paper tape reader and this is the, this is the, the sort of sending messages like equivalent of, of, of uh, telegraphs and so forth. And then we had a big step forward here. So this is a picture. Uh, one that, that we had, it was a big, a big advance. Look at this terminal compared to, I mean, that's really modern, right? <laughs> well, you don't quite feel that way. And then the thing, the next big step forward that really made the difference for us was DEC came out with the LSI 1123. LSI stands for Large Scale Integrated Circuits. No longer was it, whoops, I've gone too many here. No, whoops, sorry. No longer was it transistors, right? And my first introduction to Ray Weiss, who some of you may know of as the person who invented gravity wave laser interferometer systems, right? That was his thing. My first introduction to him was going to visit him in his lab at MIT, and he was sitting on the floor smoking his pipe and replacing transistors in a PDP-11 because they didn't have the money to buy a new one, and they had been electric surge and it had gone, had it gone out. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a big advance forward to go to, to chips where you just had to replace the whole chip and you could do thousands of transistors at a time, right? So here's the, here's the LSI 11. And you will notice how much memory we had. Suddenly, we're up to 248K of memory, OK? That meant we didn't no longer have to have the foreground program in less than 32K of memory. Right? So, you know, it's, it, it, it was a little tricky to get everything to work in that kind of, kind of days. Nowadays, we, we don't think that our cell phones should, should have less than four megs of memory or it's going to be impossible, right? And then the LSI 11, 20, the 73 came on a little while longer and it, it, it ended up to four megs, okay? So why was this useful? Well, it allowed us to run experiments real time. So here's an actual picture of one of the ones Horst wanted me to show you. This is an LSI 11, I think 23, it might have been a 73 by then. These are disk drives. I'm sure these were several megabyte disks because otherwise we had these big floppy disks. And there's a big floppy disk reader in here. And there's the old teletype. And here's a newfangled 
CRT. Right. And, but this was when we were building the, the experiments we were doing. This is the prototype for COBE where we're trying to measure very tiny differences. So we look at two different parts of the sky and measure the difference, interchange the horns. So it's on a rotating table, so we could, we could do that. So this was the prototype for what was going to go on the COBE satellite. So this we were building in the 1970s. At the same time, we were starting to make measurements of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, which we thought was the relic radiation from the Big Bang, but we had to prove it because, you know, it, it never had curled over yet. We had just seen the, the shape and we wanted to measure it more precisely. So we, I formed an Italian-American collaboration and we actually ran seven instruments and uh, a lot of other activities here in this cold place where we made it colder with liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. The computer was in this hut. Right? It got treated special. You got to be inside. The rest of us had to sit out in the snow. And the same thing, we went to the South Pole, same group. Now you can tell this, it's really Italian-Americans because we, we decided we'd take this picture to doing that. And I have a close-up so you can tell that I was there, see? <laughs> <laughs> well, with the lights on, it doesn't come out so bright. But it's not the ceremonial South Pole. This is the real one or at least the real one that day, because the Antarctic Ice Chief is moving a little bit, but the, ge the Geological Survey comes and put a, puts a little stamp in every year and they move the sign so that you know where it is, right? Because they, you know, the it's a big glacier, as you can see, it's almost two miles thick and, and it's moving, moving slowly. And, but that wasn't, the South Pole wasn't remote enough and cold enough for us. We went about a kilometer or two away and dig a big, a big pit, and we had this screen to keep us from the wind. So we're out here on a balmy day, uh, taking it. We have our liquid nitrogen, liquid helium around to make it going on. At the time, we were doing these measurements up in the mountains and at the South Pole. We went to the South Pole twice. Um, you know, there are other. Deck was making some more advances. So Deck's first advance was to go from a 12-bit to a 16-bit. This was the major thing: 32 bits. You guys cannot imagine how much that opened up, right? <laughs> because, you know, it's just, it's just kind of something. So we, we, we got the VAXs and we took our legacy software from our PDPs and we migrated them into the VAXs and then we could do all kinds of crazy things. And eventually we created DEC Alpha clusters. And by that time I realized how important computers were to us. So we actually were rolling our budget where we were buying some new computers every year. So we were, our cluster was always upgrading, right? So NERSC has a different problem. It has to get a whole new cluster every now and then, right? So at some point you'll figure out how to do rolling clusters, but we'll see, <laughs> well, hopefully. But anyway, we eventually built a cluster farm like this in which we did the data analysis for Kobe. And, our, and it was very challenging for us to do that. Um, even though it seemed like we had a simple problem, we had a 6,144 by 6,144 matrix with many multiple right-hand sides to the matrix equation. We had to invert that and find the solutions. And that actually ended up taking us about three months of running in order to do it on our, on our alpha cluster, which at the time was like 30 alphas. Right? It's, they were really fast and they were really cool. At LBL, we were using the Walnut computer, as we used to know it affectionately, the CDC 7600. I don't know if you, any of you guys are old enough to remember that. But this is the beginning of making computers in a more compact configuration in order to not be limited by the speed of, of, of signals, right? It was just set by the speed of light. And the other thing that was the great improvement was we had the people's printer and card reader, right? We knew it here as a user, but we had some visitors from the Soviet bloc. I think they were actually Ukrainians, and they referred to it as the people's printer, and I thought that was just a much better name. And there was two great advances here. You could go in and read your own programs in the computer, and you could get your own printout, so you could run your job anytime, right? And so thank you, Computer Center, for doing that. That means we could be running stuff all the time. But the really big thing was they started to allow us to store images of our programs in the computer. They gave us a little space in the computer where no longer did I have to read five file drawers worth of cards in every time I wanted to run a really big long program with a lot of data. I could just run an update deck. So it would be a little thin deck that said, please replace these cards in the program with these, these cards and then run the program. Right? And that's, that just made your life a lot easier, right? And you guys didn't come along until we actually had terminals where you could do this all remotely and there weren't cards, there weren't anything like that. But that was the steps along the way. So the same time this was going on, that we were learning how to use this and doing simulations. So I should not neglect saying simulations are not to be very important. We were working on the instruments for COBE. So FIRAS stands for Far Infrared 
absolute spectrophotometer. And what it do, was designed to do is the same trick that we were doing before. There's a big antenna that looks at the sky. There's a small antenna that looks at an internal load whose temperature is controlled to whichever temperature you want because we ran the door at about 2.7 Kelvin, we could heat it up and down so we could know what was going on. And then we had a thing to replace the universe, this long thing which is protected that could rotate into place. And so instead of looking at the universe, we'd be looking at this calibrator which we very precisely made. And so as soon as we got up there and started taking data, we knew the answer because here's the predicted black body curve and here's our error bars multiplied by 400. Right? Well, that's pretty good. So that's the first part of what's going on. Here's the prediction of a 2.72 Kelvin black body, this dashed line. Here the red is the fire ash data. Here are our ground base, you know, uh, from White Mountain and from the South Pole. Here's Spencer's and Wilson's original point. There's a, some of the other ground base stuff that's in there, and there's a couple of balloons and so forth. But you can see, and here's the difference, and you see fire ash errors are incredibly small. There was a University of British Columbia, Columbia University of British Columbia rocket that was very much like a small version of fire ass, and it was launched uh, about a year after, well, less than a year afterwards, called COBRA, and it made this sort of blue curve that sort of verified that we were in the right ballpark. So I have one more that has more blown up. There was a tremendous amount of work to make these measurements, you know, going all around the world and doing that. Look at how that's nothing compared to the precision we got from doing it in space and doing it precisely and analyzing the data fairly in a fairly complicated way. It's a, it's a Fourier transform spectrometer, but there are many other issues in there, so the data analysis actually took a fair amount of time. But it, its computing constraints were not as severe as measuring the, the temperature variations. So here's a picture of Kobe when it was at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and I went down to inspect to make sure the shields. There's a long story. We were supposed to go on the shuttle, and then we got the shuttle blew up, lots of things happened, and then we had to have a deployable shield and I had to go down and make sure it deployed properly and then there were no holes when it deployed and so forth. So we took these pictures. So this is the door in which fire ass and the derby are that's covered over. And uh, here's two of the three DMR instruments. So they're back-to-back -back horns. That's the one you saw the prototype of. This is at a frequency that's twice as high, so the wavelength is twice as short. And there's one that's three times as high on the other side that, uh, that are shown there. So this is us. The final time that we saw the satellite up and close, and I figured at the launch that was the last time I would see it, but that night I did see it again because it was in orbit and you was in the terminated orbit, so it was in the sun and I was in the dark and you could see it. So this is what it looked like, except no sun was on the inside, it's just shining on the solar cells. There's three solar cells, it's rotating like a chicken on rotisserie to keep the temperature uniform, but it scans nice circles in the sky. And by doing that and by having it precess with the Earth going around the sun, we were able to map the whole sky, and we made these maps. The first map, which is off here, is the universal diffuse glow. It's just green, so I didn't show you that data, but I have some real data that shows that. And then if you go down a factor of 1,000, you see what we call the dipole. It's warm here by a, part, a little bit over a part in 1,000, and cold in this direction by a little over a part in 1,000, and very smoothly in between, except along here, which is the plane of our galaxy. You'll see it clearly down here. When we, when we subtract that and go up another factor. And then we happen to live in the spiral arm, so if you look 90 degrees that way, you're looking down the spiral arm, so you see a bump. If you look 90 degrees the other way, you're also going down the spiral arm. So you see these two bumps, which are the spiral arm we're in, the galactic center is there. That's why this doesn't have a nice smooth thing, the galactic center is contributing. If you then subtract away the dipole and blow the scale up, another factor of 100, is the, the galaxy saturates along here, the galactic center, the spiral arm that we're in, the opposite anti-center anti, uh, direction. But then you see these blue regions together, red and yellow regions together, red and yellow regions together, blue regions together, blue regions together. Those are the things that we claim are the, uh, uh, are the signals from the beginning of the universe. And here is with the, the, all the known galactic contamination stuff you know, stamped out and you can see the signal that's left behind. But if you're more adventuresome, you can make a plot in colors so here's the dipole, and if it's, it's stronger in the red, it shows up red. If it's right in the right CMB, it shows up in, in white. So you see hot to cold is supposed to be white to, to dark. You take away the dipole, blow the scale up, now you can still see the spiral arms, but you can begin to see the signal that's coming from the universe. And if you take a model of the galaxy out, 
you end up with a map that looks like that. Right? So, so, but modeling the galaxy was the tricky part. So we did with cuts and we did with, with subtractions and got pretty similar answers, but we were being careful. Okay. And so not so long after that, we did two more experiments. These are balloon-borne experiments. They were maximum and boomerang. And uh, we had a big group. And then half of the group split off and went to Caltech. But we stayed collaborating. So now if I put my shadow here, maybe you guys can see. There's an actual map there. The size of the moon is about this big. So this covers a reasonable part of the sky. But you're seeing very clear structures. And when, we first, when I first saw this map, uh, and we were having our, our team meeting, I said, ah, the universe is flat. And Radic Stomper, who's one that some of you may know, he says, no, no, don't, don't jump to conclusions. If I said, I've already seen you know, 500 simulations. I know which the flat universe looks like, and I'll, I'll show you some examples later. And then Boomerang measured a little shortly afterwards, but roughly the same time, measured a much bigger patch of the sky, this part of the sky in the south, because it was a long duration flight around, around Antarctica. So already by 2001, we were starting to map out the angular power spectrum. So on the one degree scale, actually 0.9 degree scale, there's a peak. There's extra power on one degree, and then the harmonics of one degree. And those are things that we now, you guys now hear about as variant acoustic oscillations, but they're things we predicted, and because it's the power spectrum, you see the same thing ringing over and over again. And then there's a flat spectrum of stuff that uh, is the unprocessed stuff, so that the primordial spectrum of fluctuations look like this, and then when it gets processed by what goes on in the early universe, you get these bumps and wiggles and so forth. And those bumps and wiggles will, I'll show you, will tell us what's the universe made out of, right? And how much ordinary matter, how much dark matter, how much dark energy, and so forth. That, those bumps and wiggles allow you to do that. Well, about this time that we were doing this, the, the maps out of the microwave anisotropy probe, later renamed the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, because one of our collaborators and and, co and also competitors, Wilkinson died during the, during the mission, so they renamed it. It's basically the same idea as the COBE DMR. The, there's the differential microwave radiometer. It's, it, the, the antennas look in two different directions. There is a, a secondary mirror and a primary mirror. And the, the, the signal, you're looking at two, two signals at two different parts of the sky, but now you have a big antenna, so you have much smaller angular resolution. And so WMAP, instead of being in the terminated orbit near the Earth, gets sent out to the Earth's Sun Lagrange point two, and that's the place where the combined gravity of the Sun plus the Earth causes it to orbit at the same time as the Earth. So you always keep that same geometry, they all co-orbit. It's almost stable, but not quite stable. And that keeps the Sun, the Moon, and the Earth in the backward direction, so you can put your solar cells on the back, and you can put your antenna to send the data back on the back, and you can put your equipment out here and let it you know, breathe freely. But now I'm gonna show you something about the power computers that you didn't really think about. Are we here? Okay, so this is, this is the, the launching WMAP to L2. So this, this is WMAP. Okay. So the issue was, how do you compute this orbit to get it there, okay? Non-trivial. I'll show you this other one, but, but think about that orbit. This is just pretty pictures, so I can talk about that. Computers couldn't do it in those days. There was a guy who could kind of visualize it and get the right range, and then our computers in the US could make that calculation. The Russians and the European Space Agency had to build more powerful rockets so they could go direct. Eventually, we, eventually the US has done that too. But that's the issue is that, you know, somehow, you had to get yourself restricted enough range. Now I believe that Hopper could do this job, right? You could just say, all right, I don't, my rocket's not powerful enough to take this thing out to L2, but if I get a gravity assist boost from, you know, from the moon, I can make it, right? And, and, and you all have heard about using gravity assist from Jupiter, because that's an easier, a simpler calculation to do. But here, where you have to do this orbit and sink yourself to the moon and avoid a lot of stuff, that's a little tricky. Okay. So that's how you get out to this region where you want to have the sun out here, the, the earth and the moon behind you, and you're, and you're out here rotating around, you know, like, a bar, or like the chicken on the barbecue, but now only your backside's getting warmed. Right. So, okay, so up in the corner, I have one last little thing here. So here's the, the, the sun, the earth. Now here's the shadow of the earth. Now, 
if you're going to a lot of trouble keeping your stuff stabilized, you don't want to go into eclipse. That is, you don't want to go into shadow because there's a big temperature change. So the orbit is the orbit around the unstable place. So you need a little station keeping. So if you look, the orbit as, the, as it goes around has to orbit around and avoid that. Now here you're, you're starting to do computing power. You have to make these maps and then you have to combine them and subtract away the galaxy, make a different model for the galaxy and separate out and make your map of what the, the temperature anisotropies look like. Now, that's not so hard, right? I mean, it's the sky, except these variations are about a part in 100,000 of the total signal coming from the sky, of the, of the main signal coming from the sky, and it's actually less than a part in 100,000 for all signal because at the lowest frequency, the galaxy is fairly bright. So when you look back there, and so you start to realize at this point, you're in a hundred th few hundred thousand by few hundred thousand matrix solving problem. And if you're doing the really full up job, it's like a million by a million matrix. Thing. That, that also tax computers, but approximations were made in order to make these maps so that it wasn't done. But when we get the Planck, we're doing 10 million by 10 million, and we're trying not to approximate. We're, we're solving by iteration and so forth. We're trying not to approximate. So here's the COBE data, and then we're gonna neatly transform it in the WMAP data. So if you paid attention, you'd know that they're almost the same, but just because in case you weren't paying attention, here you can do the comparison, right? Dark, dark, red, red. The big features are there in both of them. Now though, we have a lot more angular resolution, right? Now we see a lot more structure. Now we're starting to see the detail. And then we can do the angular power spectrum because we're going to assume that it's sort of random on the sky and there's no orientation on the sky that's preferred. The universe doesn't prefer that direction over any other direction, that the universe is sort of isotropic in a large sense. And, and, and we kind of know that from our physics experiments that angular momentum is conserved and things like that. If there were preferred directions, we, we'd have to make some adjustments. So we reduce what's a two-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional problem and just measure as a function of angle on the sky or multiple moment, we measure how much power there is and, and average over, over what kind of rotation angle is. This is just separation angles. And you see the Kobe data was down in this region. This is the first peak and the second peak. And now we're beginning to fill in the third, the fourth, and the fifth peak, right? So now we're in the early 2000s. And every, every step along the way, we've challenged computers. First, it was to actually just take the data now it's the process the data, but the level of data we have so much. And sometimes I see people doing experiments now where they say, well, we don't want to actually make that much of a trigger. Let's just record all the data. Uh, and I'm going, yeah, well, you can now, but that's not the design experiment. Before, we could not record all the data. We had to make decisions we had to do. And high energy physics, they have to make triggers, and it's always an issue. But there's a lot of experiments now where people just record all the data, and they've got you know, some number of mini terabytes or petabytes of data and they got to sift through it to find that little bit of stuff that's good. Here, we're still really dragging the, the computer. But from that, we have made what we call our current model of cosmology. So imagine there's a sphere around us. This is a slice of it. And we follow that sphere backwards in time. And we, we have this model that, that you'll presumably hear some about uh, in the next lecture from Saul, that, that we have this period of accelerated expansion, which we label as caused by the dark energy. And we're trying to find out more about it. And as you go back that, that period, say oh, roughly a third of the way back, it no longer is accelerating, it's slowing down. That's when the structure formed, when the first stars and the first galaxies formed, and they merged in the large scale structure form. And eventually you got the modern galaxies. Our solar system happened to form at roughly this period, but that, that's partly accidental because once you start making galaxies, you start making solar systems. So we can see. And then we're worried these days, so we're looking back here to before, through the period we call the Dark Ages, before there were stars, back to the time when the universe was as hot as the sun, but it's expanded a thousand times since then. So this is not quite the scale, but you know, even log scale. That, but this is what the universe looked like when it was 400,000 years old compared to 13.7 billion years. So it's roughly the difference between you now and you 12 hours after conception in terms of time scales. And if we go back further, the universe gets much smaller until we think there's a period way back here when there was inflation, a period when the universe went through as much expansion in a fraction of a second as it has in the 14 billion years since then. And at that point, all 100 billion galaxies that's in this sphere here 
they were back in a size much smaller than an atom, and quantum fluctuations became important, right? So it's a simple model, and we can calculate that, because we have powerful computers and simple algorithms. And uh, in fact, one of the people who helped do that is one of the professors here, so he was at that time a, a grad student and a postdoc, was Euros Sheljak, and uh, he and Matthias Zaldearaga made some of the code that allows us to simulate billions of, millions of universes in short times, I mean, in terms of what goes on. They make some approximations, but they're not bad. So the CMB angular power spectrum now measured, for, and we put in our review, oh, you can see it with the lights on here. This is surprising. Usually we try to make it a very faint yellow for our best fit model. What I didn't point to you, out to you before on that plot that I showed you before, even in 2001, we still had a, uh, what we call the cold dark matter universe. We didn't have the dark energy in it, even though it had been discovered by then. It took another couple of years before we started having what we call lambda CDM or dark energy. Uh, dark matter universes, right? But this is the best fit sort of lambda CDM universe, so including the dark energy. And now you can see with WMAP and with the new measurements that were coming in, you're seeing the second, third, fourth, fifth, hence of the sixth, but not quite the seventh peak yet. So we were making progress. Well, why, why do you care about this? Well, now you've got your computers, you simulate a whole bunch of universes. That's why some of you know I gave a talk in the fall about that we're a simulation because if you do a real detailed simulation, you get us too. But anyway, uh, what can we learn from the spectral analysis? Well, the first thing you can do is look at the total amount of energy, which is equivalent to looking at the curvature of space-time. I'll come back to it. And you find out that shifting that around basically just shifts this power spectrum left and right. And if the universe is, is more open, it shifts this way. If it's more closed, it shifts that way. And there's a little bit of stuff that happens down in the, in the really large angular scales. If you put in dark energy, it looks like you can't tell much because it only happens down here where the, this kind of activity goes on. But now our CMB measurements are getting so precise, there are even small variations here that we, that we can begin to pick out and, and make some stuff. But baryons is the physicist's word for you know, protons and neutrons. It's, it's the ordinary matter. Bar if you increase baryons, it pushes this peak up, that peak down, this peak up, so forth. But if you put in dark matter, or, or all matter, it pushes all the peaks up. So you can actually, by looking at the ratio of the second peak to the first and the third peak, you can tell how much is dark matter versus how much is ordinary matter and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's six parameters. You can fit for the six parameters very, very carefully. So the issue we have now is are we gonna have to add more parameters or are we gonna end that? So I'm gonna, I promised I would talk to you about is the universe flat? And the answer is very simple. We look here with our eyes and we judge how big things are by projecting back in straight lines. And if the universe is curved, the light will travel a curved path. Otherwise, we get this nice Euclidean geometry in an expanding universe, which is a little trickier. Or if it's, if it's uh, open, you, you have the other thing. So I have this nice video. This, this tells you the same pattern on the sky does this, but here's a nice little video that, that, that WMAP paid for and uh, does it. So we're out in the universe. We're gonna put out our imaginary physics grid lines. There's the pattern in the real universe. And if we assume the universe is flat, light's gonna travel in straight lines. And we'll see a nice picture that looks just, just like the, the universe, right? But if the universe is closed, light gets bent towards us and things get magnified and look bigger. And if the universe is open, things get pulled in and they, for, they, they look to be at smaller angles. And so if you've seen enough of these simulations and you see a map that looks just like this, both in terms of the spot sizes, but also in terms of the actual levels. Here, these are made to look to be the same levels. The levels change a little bit in those situations. You, that's how you can begin to recognize the universe is close to flat. So I don't say it's exactly flat, but it's really close to flat. And so that's, that's interesting. That's an example of what you can learn. You can do the same thing for how much ordinary matter is, how much dark matter is. You can compare it to the actual observations, or you can compare it to the power spectrum, you can, and you get some results. So, We've made some progress in this field. We went from COBE, it's 6144 pixels by 6144 pixels in the, in the thing. That was launched in 89. Our results came out in 92, made a big splash. And in 2000, WMAP was launched. The results came out in about 2003, the main results. It had many frequencies that in principle had resolution to here, but when you had to take out the galaxy, you had to use the largest wavelength scale, and that gives you poor resolution, so you got pixels that look like that, 
And then in 2000, May 2009, we launched the Planck satellite, uh, which was very interesting because it was you know, a rainstorm before and a rainstorm after and clouds and stuff going on. But this is from, from uh, Kourou, and so it, they're used to, uh, it's in French Guiana, they're used to having to launch through rainy season, and uh, they managed to launch it very spectacularly successfully. And it has nine different wavelengths and, and more sensitivity, but also more wavelengths and more angular resolution. So you get this much higher resolution map, and this part's the smudgy part where you get reasonable polarization data. These are to represent polarization vectors. So here's a picture, just to show you the plant can do it. So sorry, I was giving, I used, pulled a slide from a talk I just gave where they like Russian. Um, so here are the antennas, here's the secondary and the primary. This whole thing is out at L L2. It's uh, warm on one side and cool. There's a set of radiators, so it cools down to quite cold temperature. And then we have refrigerators uh, on board that, that bring some of the detectors down below a tenth of a Kelvin. So as it scans around, the light comes from the sky. We don't paint the sky, the sky paints the detectors, right? And here's the plane of the galaxy. So at nine wavelength bands, you see the galaxy very clearly. The, it's, the sensitivity is very great, so you see the dust that very clearly that sticks well off the galactic plane. Now it's going to unfold and rotate because the magic of computers is you can put it in a nice a map and a nice representation that you can use. So here's the plane of a galaxy, the, the two spiral arms that we're in. It's what it looks like in the optical. Sorry, it was too fast for my, and the resolution isn't quite good enough, so I'll show you. So then you can take your different wavelengths, fit to the three components of the galaxy and a, some mystery component if you want to allow for it or marginalize over it. And then for the cosmic microwave background, which shows pretty clearly here to begin with. And you get a map that looks like this. So this looks pretty much like the WMAP map, except now there's even more speckles and spots. But it's still dominated by the stuff that's on the 0.9 degree scale. You know, the, the, huge, the, the big peak is on the structural scale. That's the, 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 the acoustic horizon, the sound horizon, at the time the universe gets to be about the same temperature as the surface of the sun. So there's Planck doing its job, right, out in the universe. And what we have is we have a series, approximately on 10 year increments. I don't think the next one will be in 10 years. I think we're gonna fall off the Moore's curve, but we'll see what happens. So Kobe is the same piece of the sky. Kobe barely detected stuff on the large scales but it detected it and saw that it was right and, and motivated people to go on. WMAP in that same part of the sky sees much more structure and Planck sees a lot more structure. And now we have you know, the South Pole Telescope, uh, the Anaconda Cosmology Telescope, and Polar Bear, uh, which is Berkeley-centric uh, one, making even higher angular resolution sort of measurements in this kind of regime. I didn't happen to have a beautiful plot of that. So this, this map that we have, this, this concept we have, now we're testing it in much more detail because we're getting a lot more information here, but we're also doing galaxy surveys that tell us a lot whether this, what's going on in this region is what we, we project it to be doing. And so we're doing incredible calculations and simulations on some stupid computer cluster. I don't, you know, well, you know, it was pretty good at the time. So one of the things we did was we made this angular power spectrum and uh, this is our best fit model, right? This green curve is the best fit model. Now you can actually count seven peaks. We've gotten, gotten quite far. So this, this is up to date in terms of what's going on. And now we're worrying about little things, these anomalies. This data point's a little low. These data points are a little low. That one's a little high. We're worrying about little things now that are deviations from our model. But in terms of, of our, our overall fit, we have things in in an amazing shape, considering that that the first discovery of these fluctuations, the few points down in here, that was 23 years ago, and now we have mapped the entire curve out with high precision. But we've done even more than that, and so I have to since I'm running close to the end of my time, I have to skip over a couple of things and go straight to bicep. So here's a slide I pulled out of a talk I gave in 2005 of the bicep instrument as it was being deployed to the South Pole. Now some of you guys heard about them last month, claiming they've seen signals for uh, the evidence for gravity waves in the early universe, which is really fairly much directly evidence for uh, the, the inflation and the energy scale of inflation, right? So 
think these guys have been working on this project for 10 years. The data analysis is fairly sophisticated, but it's a very simple instrument. It's not nearly as taxing as the kind of things we're doing in the satellites or the big arrays, you know, thousand element arrays and so forth that, 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 that are going, and many thousand, soon to be many thousand element arrays that are going on in the next generation of experiments, that some of whom are actually operating. And so if these guys are right, and that's part of the debate what's going on, uh, if these guys are right, we're in a regime where we're, we're entering in, in the, the fourth and final phase of looking at anisotropies. Now, how can I say that? Well, you can make a prediction if our model is correct. So I've been talking mostly about the temperature power spectrum. And this is the temperature power spectrum that comes from scalars. That's our technical term. What scalars mean is energy density fluctuations. You can also have metric fluctuations, that is fluctuations in the fabric of space and time. Those are tensor fluctuations. And when they come inside the horizon, they can be propagate and freely become gravity waves. At least the, 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 the space space part of them can. So this, as soon as you measure this part, you predict all the rest of everything on this left-hand side of the, of the plot. You predict the whole power spectrum that you should see here. You predict the cross-correlation between the temperature and what we call the E-mode polarization the polarization that, that has a simple patterns around the hot and cold spots caused by the fact if there's an overdensity of matter, there is an overdensity uh, of photons, and that means when the photons are straying out, they scatter and they make a certain polarization pattern. And that also predicts the E-mode the e polarization pattern has this stuff. So these are the variant acoustic oscillations showing up here, 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 and even here. And then you predict some of these guys from the E-modes should be limbs in the B-modes by the fact that these fluctuations cause galaxies to form, and those galaxies gravitationally lens the light that's on our way from the beginning of the universe to us, and they make a slight distortion of the pattern, and that, 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 that feeds down to the B modes, right? But we had no clue of what the tensor variation is going to be because you have a degree of freedom that lets you change the energy scale of inflation. This is set by the energy scale inflation. This is set by the equation of state of inflation. There's one extra parameter, so you can adjust the two relative to each other. But as soon as you make one measurement, and now it's very hard because the temperature is buried in this temperature and the TE, everything is buried in the other things. But if you measure the B modes, and, and what BICEP has done is tried to measure what they think is the primary B modes in this region, if you measure that, it predicts everything here. And so now we have to see if it all fits together, right? And so we'll see. But if they're right, this is roughly the right scale. It's a little bit high in this plot. Anthony Chaloner did a paper a few years ago and, and plotted these out so we could all have a nice, nice plot of it. But, but if, we, if we're actually seeing, we're, start, we're seeing already just the week before the BICEP data came out from Polar Bear and from South Pole Telescope, some of the lens B modes. So we've entered the B mode era. But if it's the B modes from the, from the, the, the perturbations of space time, because making space time causes perturbations in it, then we are, we're entering the final error of what's going on. So it's more complicated. And more complicated means more computation. So here's the pattern that BICEP claims to have seen. Notice it's swirly. That's why you saw some advertisements of swirly. It's vorticity. See, so here's a hot spot. It goes around it whereas the E-modes only go out radially or tangentially. They don't go in a swirl, right? And so that's how we're separating them. And that has implications on what's happening at the, at the, at the long wavelengths or the large angular scales and uh, so forth. So all along, right from the beginning, the CMB has challenged the most powerful computers. We've, we've been pushers all the way, right? And if you notice, NERSC, when NERSC came here, Saul and I were the first people down to the beating on the door, and uh, we, we eventually ended up making C cubed, but we also pushed the Cosmology Computation Center, which NERSC runs, but we also, or computer sciences, right, but we also pushed the computers to have certain capabilities in order to, to be able to do these kind of calculations. And so what I can say is, you know, here's Hopper. You know, the reason the Hopper runs red is because of the CMB. <laughs> Because we're churning those cycles like crazy. So, okay, thank you.
These have all been uh, well attended, but this has definitely set the record. There's, uh, I guess, there's standing room only. So uh, since this is being recorded, uh, we have time for questions, but I'll hand the mic to you uh, so that, that people online can hear. So uh, questions? That was so perfectly explained. <laughs> all right, so if you guys don't ask questions, I get to give you a quiz, right? <laughs> That's what I usually do when I... Okay, there's one back here. See, you're saved. <laughs> The fact that the universe, uh, uh, universe is flat, does that imply the universe is also infinite? Ah, uh, okay. So I said it's flat, but I used the term a little loosely. I said, it's, if you heard, a couple of times I was very careful and I said it's very close to flat. And so it depends on your view. There are, there are actually multiple possibilities. One of them, which I actually had a, a grad student get her thesis on, and was, you can think of the universe as, as being simply connected so that it has a finite size and then the edges are identified. So I don't know if you remember the old days of Pong. There was a, there was a, war, you know, a space war thing where there was a sun that you could get pulled into by gravity. But when the spaceship went off one side, it appeared on the other. The universe could be like that. But it is a simulation, right? You know, and so, well, you can't prove it's not, actually. <laughs> but the... Uh, you can imagine a universe in which it is the, the, it's, it's sort of a huge cube or a huge complicated system, and you identify edges, and you have many possibilities of identifying edges. So, so we did simple versions of that and showed that if, that were, if the simple identifications were done, the universe was at least 80% as big as the, as the horizon, as the 14 billion years in every direction, and, and probably more likely peaked bigger than that. So that that part was okay, and people since then have done many studies of the, there's, there's like 24 possible kind of configurations that you can do, and they've produced different patterns, and you can make one dimension sh shorter than the, the other dimensions large. There's a lot of things you can do, and if you're on a budget, you might think that it's like putting mirrors up in a, in a tiny apartment, right? <laughs> or something like that. And, but the, the trick you can use is, if there's a carpet, and the carpet's not perfect, it will have some ripples in it, and if there's a ripple that's way longer than what you think the cell size is, then you're wrong, the cell size is bigger, right? So we have ripples, right, in the universe. And so you can do it from the galaxy surveys, you can do it from the cosmic microwave background. So that's, that's one way. So, but that still could be outside of a horizon and we haven't got the data yet, right? I mean, it's, you don't know what the dragons could be out there. And uh, so we don't know that. But the other is that if you actually look at making the universe, there are different approaches that people have of creating a universe from nothing or from almost nothing or from some other kind of universe and butting our part off. And many of those want a universe that's open, which in principle should be infinite. Many of those want a universe that's closed. Some of them do. But if the dark energy stays the wrong kind, you can actually be a closed universe but expand forever and eventually become infinite. So we don't know the answer to that question we know that it's still a question. If the universe were really closed, we'd know the answer. If the universe were really open, we'd know the answer. There was mm. infinite. We, we have, well, within reason, within, inside of the, the region where we look for dragons. And uh, so it, 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 it is a good working hypothesis that the universe is effectively infinite. But in fact, it might well be not so much bigger than the horizon that we see, although it's unlikely we're in a very special place, that, that the universe is substantially bigger than what we see, but not incredibly bigger. But it's also possible it's way bigger, right? So we don't know the answer. So I, I had a question on, uh, on how long does the, the data that you collected uh, say decades ago remain valuable? Do the new instruments <laughs> with the better data, does it, does it uh, kind of make everything that was collected before outdated? Uh, or are there still things to be learned by going back and looking at right. things that were uh, observed a while ago? Yeah, there is some potential stuff to learn, except the sensitivity of the instruments. It, we've been on the Moore's Law for sensitivity of uh, detectors of the CMB. Their sensitivity has been improving by more than a factor of two ever, approximately every 18 months. That's mm -hmm. why we've been able to go from measuring, you know, 30 microkelvin down to 30 nanokelvin mm -hmm. in, in the 20 years, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's an, actually an incredible mm -hmm. increase in what's going on. So old data is not nearly as valuable, 
unless there's some unusual phenomenon you're looking for. So I used to, when we were getting ready for Kobe, which took a long time because of the show, I used to have this printout that I would make you know, program that this, you know, back in the old days when we had giant printout sheets and so uh, And it was a plot of the photons that we were going to observe coming towards us, you know, and started out past Alpha mm -hmm. Centauri and was, you know, because mm -hmm. it was four years to launch and, right. and moving in, there's right. a spherical shell that was moving. Right. And that was my, you know, day, number of days to launch kind of, kind of chart. And so if there is something going on, so when you're looking out, you're seeing this shell, but this shell moves out one light year per year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to map out more of the history of the universe, you just keep watching the for a long time, right? So mm -hmm. I used to say, you know, when I talk to grad students, you know, there's an experiment you can do that really tells you about the geometry and everything about the universe. You just need one grad student observing the universe forever and you will map the whole universe and you can, <laughs> you know, well, at least billions of years and you can right. map the whole universe and it would it'd be interesting. Now if the universe is accelerating, you actually have a limit to how long you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's only a few, you know, maybe 100 billion years or something. <laughs> So, there's a question back here. <clears throat> so, it seems like your map of the universe has gotten more precise clearly over the years, and that your future goal is to make it even more precise and to be able to fit data points to you know the theoretical curve even better. Uh, what gain to science we made by making the map even more precise than it already is, and fitting the data to the to where it sh you know it should already be? Okay, so that's a question, and that's why I was saying I think we're entering the sort of more final phase of measuring anisotropies. At some point, even though you make your detectors better, you get down to where your photon limited, and it's just, you know, I gotta measure 10 to the 12 photons to measure a part in 10 to the, you know, 10 to the minus six, because of statistical fluctuations. There comes a point in which the sample of the universe you have is limiting you. So if you're looking on a really big scale, so you're, so you're looking at stuff that's on a 90 degree scale, you only have five samples, so five, five independent samples. You can only decompose in five. So your errors, if, you're, if you believe that the thing's a stochastic process, it's quantum mechanical fluctuations, it's a stochastic process, you have a sample of five, that looks like going out and ask five random people what their answer is. You, you get different answer than if you ask a thousand people what their answer is. You get more representative sample. So by the time you get to the you know, genre polynomial, 100, you're essentially, you get, you know, LL plus one kind of number. You get out to a reasonable large sample. But when you, you know, when you get out to really large scales, then you have other systematics affecting you. And so we're at a point, we're reaching the point where in another generation, we should get to the point where we're kind of fundamentally limited in terms of how accurate we can go. What we're needing to do is getting some hints of what the physics is beyond what we have. That's why I was focusing back here on these anomalies. This is one of the things I'm working on. So, you know, this gave me a lot of sleepless nights, a couple of these things. <laughs> this is a little low, that's why that other plot. This guy is really low, really significantly low. There's several in a row here that are low. These are averaged together. So this guy is significantly high. They can be real. There are features in here that you don't know if they're a random sample or not. But because you have this prediction that it, that if you know one, whoops, if you know one, you should see it several places. If you see some anomaly here, you should also see it here. And right? if you see it at the, at the L equals 20, you should also <laughs> see it in the E at 20, and you should see it at the lens, but that's so tiny to see. But you should see it there, but you should also see it in the primordial power spectrum. That is, the, 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 these, are, these things, there's inflation creating stuff, there are primordial fluctuations, the C and B is just a snapshot of them. Right? It just takes, a, it's just a circular snapshot around us of what they look like. If you could go out and measure where all the galaxies are and all the clusters and the liquids are, same thing, really precisely, you can map these out in 3D. You can look to see, or, or is, that, is that little structure I see there, does it show up in the, in the polarization? Does it show up in the, so, so I think it's gonna be combined measurements and looking to see if this model we have that has only six parameters, is it able to describe the universe with incredible precision, and therefore we think there's something beyond it, but we have no clue, or are we gonna actually get a clue? And I think we're getting a clue already. That's what was exciting for me about this, this swirly map, because as soon as you have this, you only have one point. Only one point's enough to make all these predictions and the crosslinks, it makes a big deal, right? So just getting the magnitude of what this is 
is, is half the battle, right? And, 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 and if you take this as real, it suddenly has implications for a lot of things. And so that's why it's a big deal. And we're going to run the computers night and day trying to figure out what's going on as soon as we get a little more data. So we're looking towards the fall when there are four experiments that should be getting new results that will confirm or deny or argue with this. You know, the worst case is you know, two votes one way and two votes the other or something. But by, with a year from now, we'll have four new sets of results in, and we'll have some good idea whether this is true or not. And, uh, but it'll be interesting to see. But I don't want to go on forever on this while I'm getting older, according to Horst. And, uh, but also, I think there's a lim diminishing return. There comes a point where it's diminishing returns, and you have to look at combine you know, the fact that, there's a, that you have a model that's working very well, and it makes prediction. And you can test to see if you're seeing anomalies. You can test to see if it's working really well. That's the other parts of physics have been in this kind of period. Sometimes they break out, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they need more data in the long run, but that's what we have to see. But it's, it's an incredible triumph to have gotten this far because we have a model with only a few parameters, and with that, we can predict essentially everything we see to better than 1%. We're, trying to, we're having to improve our simulation codes for making galaxy down to, to 10th percent level to try and look for deviations, and that's not an easy job. Right? It's, but th that's just showing you how much progress we've made when, when I started out doing these kind of measurements, if it was considered a great time if you knew something to 50%. There were lots of things we used to say, well, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the, the physics numbers, and then there's the astronomy numbers, and then the cosmology guesses. And now it's not. I mean, it's, it, we're, we're, we're computing things in a real way, and it's not so simple. Because even though every step is simple, there's a lot of steps that it adds up to a complicated universe. So, do we have another question? Is it safe to assume that maybe the next Nobel might be for confirming some of that inflationary period? Uh, and if so, what's the one after that going to be for? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is an interesting question. Do you want me to gossip? <laughs> because, because it's gossip. I mean, I know. So. It, the, the, the next, you know, if you look at the fields and so forth, there are many fields in physics. For, for talking about Nobel Prize in physics, there are many fields in physics, and th there's a lot of excitement in cosmology lately. So, cosmology has actually been getting Nobel Prizes at slightly higher than the rate you would anticipate based on the population <laughs> profile. So, you know, the demographics of physics, right? And, but the next, next logical time for a Nobel Prize to come out would be not this year, but next year for the field. That would be about as fast. And now the question is, what would you give it for if you were giving it in cosmology? Well, if DAISY had to be confirmed, or whatever it is, and that's why Mortensen's Seljak paper screw, screws up the calculation, because now they're depending on either Planck coming out and telling something about the foregrounds, or, or getting their new results out and confirming it, and so forth. And so they made the claim, but then their claim, people are saying, is not enough standard deviations to count as a real claim anymore. Right? And uh, so that's one of the issues. However, the other thing that confused thing was just, a, just a five days ago, four or five days ago, the Cavalier Prize was given to people for the theory of inflation. So the Cavalier Prize is given out by the Norwegian king, <laughs> right? And so it was given to um, uh, Alan Guth. Uh, Andre Linde and Alexei Starovinsky. Now, some of us have been speculating if a theory prize was going to give out, it would probably be given out to Starovinsky, who would have had the very first paper, Guth had the second paper, and Sato, who had the third paper, even though there are other people you could consider. But, you know, how I actually think inflation's on a slightly firmer footing than this discovery. This discovery would kind of nail it, but it was, it's, it's, you know, there's an awful lot of things that make inflation look right. And it certainly has influenced our view of the field in a tremendous way. So, but, you know, now does the Nobel Committee who would be making the decision, are they going to be, you know, do they have a problem if they want to give it somebody slightly different than the Cavalier Prize or whatever? It's a, so now I think the, the, the field is confused, but then the next cycle is five more years later or something is a sort of, in a, in a reasonable kind of time period. And if you're really smart, you can kind of guess what areas, because they rotate people on and off the Nobel Committee. Well, there's many stages, but there's a final selection committee. And there's certain, the people who have expertise 
and cosmology got rotated off shortly after, well, basically about the time Saul got the prize, and and it's there's only one left on. So you can, you know, they have to, they'd have to pull in their friends, you know. <laughs> It's not, I mean, and there are stuff, there's, there's huge levels. I mean, there's nominations, there are committees that do reviews, and there are committees that actually prepare cases. And it, so it's not like they're, but, but you have to realize there is a lot more people and results deserving prizes than there are prizes. And so there, there are going to be situations where they aren't going to come out. And so that's why I say the Cavalier Prize probably confuses the issue. So. Uh, I have a question regarding the flat universe. Let's, uh, can one assume that uh, photons travel along the uh, gravitation, overall gravitation field, along the tangential to the gravitation field, along the isosurface? And as a result, uh, you, you see the flat universe uh, due to the photon, uh, uh, photon traveling pathway. Right. So, but in reality, the gravitation is like spherical or whatever. Right, okay. So. The, the point is that the universe may have a geometry that's flat or not quite flat, but in it, the, that would be the case if it had a uniform distribution of matter and energy. The matter and energy is, are, are lumped up. Because of that, we have perturbations. So that light that would normally be traveling through an expanding universe, so it actually has a, depending on what frame you look, if you look in the co-moving frame, which is a frame that makes light travel on 45 degrees, then it looks like a nice straight line. Even then, even in that frame, if you go near a cluster of galaxies or close, very close to a galaxy, the trajectory will be slightly disturbed and you do lensing. And in fact, I didn't have it here in the talk, but one of the calculations that Planck has done is to actually reconstruct the lensing map, that is the projection. There's a that, you know, here's your source, which is the cosmic microwave background. Here's some structure in the middle, and here you're looking at it, and the light travels, and it gets, dis it gets slightly disturbed in its path along the way. And you can reconstruct how much that is. If you think you understand the theory of the universe well enough, you can then fit to what you think the original source looked like on average, and then make a map of what the distortion, you know, what the lensing distortion looked like. And so Planck has done that, and we published that in a paper I don't know, in the spring. I mean, I'm sorry, late last fall. And uh, uh, it, uh, I'm trying to remember when it was, but yeah, it was within the last year. Uh, and that's the first half of the data. The second half of the data will be coming out in, in October and then a little bit more after that. And um, it, uh, you, you can do that. And now you have to say, well, did I make a mistake? Is the universe much more comp There are other possible geometries that tend towards the kind of geometry we know we're in in the present day, that you can start out with, a, they're called Bianchi spaces, you can start out with a more distorted kind of thing, but there's certain ones that have then evolved towards our situation. And so it is possible that you have a more complicated universe. It's not very likely because the, the, the phase space for that is very small, but it's still possible, right? And so there was an attempt to look for, for some evidence of that kind of thing in the CMB data. So far, there's no strong evidence for that. But it is possible that on a huge scale or back in time scale, a huge scale back in time, that the universe wasn't quite so flat. But it's not, I'm not guaranteeing it's perfectly flat anyway. What I'm saying is for, the, for a reasonably long period in reasonably big spaces, it's pretty flat. But you've got to average over a cluster. You know, we're in a potential well here, right? I mean, light doesn't bend very much, 10 meters in a second, right? I mean, it's not. It's not very far that it that it bends, but light bends if I send a you know, if I send my laser beam across the, it doesn't go in a straight. It gets bent slightly, so there is bending going on all the time. It's just usually very minor, and uh, it's it, and so I believe that we've treated that reasonably well. But there is always prejudice, and usually people do the fits from the simplest possible model because in the old days we had no data, and so you you chose what looked pretty and what was simple. So now we have a lot more data and people are being more systematic. I'm sure someone is writing a thesis on this right now. <laughs> one more question. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a question for $1 million, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me see the cash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll start with $20. 
as much as I am <laughs> right now, cash. But I can write you a check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, suppose we have uh, an efficient detector for Higgs bosons in a couple of decades from now, and we are mapping the universe on Higgs bosons, and we have angular distribution of Higgs. Are we going to finally get the shape of the universe, or not yet? Well, I think our map and the photons is going to be much better. The Higgs is everywhere. It's, Higgs is supposed to be here in this room, right? It's supposed to be this continuum condensate everywhere. And so it's not propagating to us from a long distance to provide it, like the photons are to provide us the information. It is, it is here already. It's a question of the disturbances in the field. It, it's, it's like, you know, there's a trampoline and people over there jumping up and down and you're over at the edge feeling it. That's, it's a different than when you, when you get to watch them by light. They're, they're, so it, it'll be different. Now, if we could use gravity waves, then we could see back to really beginning time. So someday we may, may, may be doing that. There's proposal, well, there's a pre-proposal thought to make a thing called the Big Bang Observer, right? Which is a, a really big version of LISA, which is a laser interferometer in space that's, that, that the European space, they, somehow the US has dropped out of for a while. The European Space Agency is pushing forward. And that's to measure gravity waves, and we'll see black hole mergers in, in galaxies that have merged and so forth. But if you build one on a much bigger scale, you can see longer wavelength gravity waves. You can try and look to see the gravity waves that came from the beginning of the universe. And you can also image things back to much earlier time because they decouple much earlier. And likewise, if you could figure out how to image neutrinos, you could, you could the neutrinos decouple at a much earlier time. So those are. Those are messengers that come moderately directly and carry the information fairly preserved. The Higgs is not likely to be that case. So the Higgs by itself decays. If it's in the condensate, it's connected in a big membrane across the universe. So, Francesca, so we'll make this the last question. So. <laughs> she, she gets privileged because she organized it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So in the 60s, author Madeleine Lengel wrote A Wrinkle in Time, and I see that you have written Wrinkles in Time. Yeah, so I didn't which actually know that, or maybe didn't remember. I might have seen it and didn't remember but it. But the, so the question is, which title came first, and is there a relationship at all between the two? Yeah, the, the answer is, uh, I don't think that I'd ever seen it. It's a, I have, it was pointed out to me when I published Wrinkles in Time that, um, that there was such a book, and I found that it's a very delightful children's book. It's quite, it's the pre-Harry Potter kind of kind of book, and uh, she didn't make as much money, but <laughs> but anyway, uh, I recommend the book. <laughs> but there was no direct relationship. The Wrinkles in Time. I was looking for an interesting title, and uh, I was trying to make sure that I made the point that the real things we were seeing were the 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 temperature fluctuations were what I call the scalars, but that's the time-time component. It's the, it's the wrinkle in the time component of the metric more than the wrinkle in the space component. Even though we talk about gravitational potential being distortion of space, it's distortion of spine, time too. And in the really low field, the time one actually dominates or something. But it was just to get people to think a little more broadly, right? Now the problem is people thought it was a cosmetic book. <laughs> not cosmetology, you know, cosmetology, not cosmology. <laughs> okay, so let's th thank uh, Professor Smoot one more time. Thank you.